Genesis, first book of the Bible, chapter 11. It's good to have you with us. We had some fun singing tonight, amen. And uh, appreciate your prayers for me. Uh, on top of everything else, it's a body ache day. And uh, Philly Philip knows what I'm talking about. And um, how many times did you fall off a scaffold, Philip? Oh. Uh, yeah, I was fortunate. I'm, my reach is eight feet. Yeah, so I can paint and tape from the floor, but being on stilts would not be a good idea for me. Yeah. So it's the falls and the accidents and the damage from electricity that all carries weight with me now and then. Genesis chapter 11. Um, Let's focus on what God did to stop Babel. Because I think that issue is very, very important. Um, Especially nowadays, um, the first school that I, first Bible college I went to was in Oklahoma. Oklahoma is sort of the, the birthing ground for most of the charismatic movement. A lot of the big charismatic ministries are in Oklahoma and or Texas. Oral Roberts' ministry was in Tulsa. um, And just uh, uh, Kenneth Hagin's ministry was in outside of Tulsa. And then there's a road out there outside on, on the outskirts of Tulsa. One charismatic church after another. I mean, they're everywhere. Joel Osteen, obviously he's from Houston. Kenneth Copeland is from Texas. So it just seemed that's where it got a lot of its ground gained at. And um, the radio station, the gospel radio station out in Oklahoma City was, um, it was a charismatic owned radio station. So they played a lot of charismatic uh, programs during the day. And um, they taught you know, in these gifts of the Spirit, that one of the evidences of salvation, or they'll say the evidence that the Holy Ghost baptized you, is, um, is that you will speak with other tongues. And so I've listened to quite a bit of their teaching, and listened to how they teach, what they say about it, how they perform it, which in some cases, it's fake. It's fake as a $3 bill. I've listened to Rodney Howard Brown enough to know that he uses a list of words and phrases repeatedly in all the years that he's been putting his show on. You can, you can tell he's speaking words that he's either made up or they're in some language, but he repeats them. He, he thinks nobody will remember, but he repeats phrases to pretend that he's speaking in tongues. Kenneth Copeland, I think, is better at it than he is. And I think it takes practice for these guys to fake it. So I do believe people fake it. I also believe that there there are spirits that will cause people to speak in an unknown tongue. And And I do not believe that their unknown tongue is from the Holy Spirit. I do not believe that. And I'm going to lay the evidence out tonight, next Sunday night or whatever for why I believe what I believe. If this was something of God, remember, I went through this. I went to a tongue speaking church 25 years ago and said, God, if this is me, I want it. If it's not, you know me well enough to know I don't want anything from you that's not from you. I don't want something that's fake or phony. When I went down to the altar and was standing there, the woman behind me that the Holy Ghost had me listening to. Holy Ghost said, Mike, you know she's faking. Because all she was doing was, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. It was a repeated da-da-da-da-da. In a high, in a high-pitched voice. And I went, that's not, that's not even a language. There's no language, da 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 there is no language so is what the tongue speakers say is it of god is it of the holy ghost is there a private prayer language you can pray that is in a tongue that you will not cannot ever understand 
Is there a secret language that all of the angels speak and it's their common language and we will never know it or understand it? Or is that also something that's made up? Because that's one of the claims they say. First, uh, Genesis 11, uh, verse 5, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children and men builded. The Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound. The word confound means confuse. Make it not knowable, their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So then, verse 8, so the Lord scattered them abroad from, the, from thence upon the face of the whole earth, of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. So, was this God blessing the inhabitants of Babel by giving them this elevated speech, this new thing? Was it a move of the Holy Spirit? Was it a gift of God's Spirit? Was it a blessing that God was giving to the people of Babel? No, it was punishment. It was a curse. And I want you to ask this question. Which does the Holy Ghost do for us? Cause us to know something? Or cause us to not know anything? Which does the Holy Ghost lead us into? Does the Holy Ghost lead us into knowledge and understanding and wisdom? Or does the Holy Ghost lead us into confusion? Okay, unintelligent. That's what we say of a language that someone speaks we don't know. It is unintelligible. So that's what we're going to examine tonight. So go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 14. One particular chapter, Paul addressed not all of the doctrine of this, but this primary doctrine. Now, before I say anything else, again, uh, when I was in Rongo, Kenya, meeting with the pastors, and they were asking me questions, one of them heard me say something like I just asked you, you know, is, does God lead us into knowledge or does God lead us in confusion? And there were some pastors there. They were very respectful and, and I appreciated that. And they, they said that they follow the scriptures in their services. Maybe one will speak in an unknown tongue and then another one will. And the third one, and he said, by that by order, and then he said, uh, let one interpret. And as those men were telling me that they read the scriptures, they followed the scriptures, the Holy Ghost is holding me back, saying, Mike, don't go after them. So I didn't. I said, number one, I want to tell you, I appreciate you using scripture. Because so much of people want to use what feels right or whatever. They want to use some of the argument than scripture. And since you did that, I'm not going to, I'm not going to debate with you. I won't argue with it. And I won't try to prove how wrong you are. Okay. Because for some reason you are led that in that direction. I don't understand it, but it's, I'm not you. And I said, you believe scripture. I believe as much as I believe the scripture. So I'm just not, I, I will try my best to answer your question the way I see it. But I won't tell you how wrong you are and you need to straighten your act up or God's going to... I couldn't do that to them. I've, I've met Pat. One came here to visit several years ago on Wednesday night. Had a good talk with him. But it was over this issue. He was a very, very fundamental, old-time Pentecostal preacher. And he loved our ministry. He loved King James Bible. And I told him the same thing. I said, I'm, I won't argue with you. I love you. And, uh, I, you know, I, th I think the world of what you're doing for the Lord. He was a much better piano player than I am. And um, I just don't, if I know they're getting what they believe from the book. But so many people are willing to say, well, not everything God does is in the book. That's when I have an issue with them. You try to tell me this is from God. Oh, it's not in the Bible, though. Then it's not from God. That's, that's my line. So anyway... Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings tonight on your word. We love you. We ask you, Lord, to give us enlightenment. Yet show us, Father, what you would have us to know. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. Now, 1 Corinthians 4, 14. Chapter 14. Paul said this. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. Now, before I go on, let me clarify. 
we understand unknown tongues from the Bible's definition of it. And that is, on the day of Pentecost, they were not speaking, a number one, an angelic language that no one knew. Number two, they were speaking human languages from the different places where these people had come from. So was there any misunderstanding on the day of Pentecost about what the Holy Ghost was saying? At least one person understood everything that was said there. And that was the person hearing whatever disciple spoke in his language. He understood and he understood every word of it. Or else they wouldn't have recognized it. They said, well, that's not Cappadocian. That's not whatever. They w and they would have, would have went, what's up with this? We get nothing out of this except that these men are drunk. So anyway, when the Bible speaks of the gift of unknown tongues, the only definition that I can see in the scriptures is that it is God giving you the ability to speak in a language to someone who understands that language where before you had not known that language yourself. God laid that gift, he got in your mouth and he spoke the words in the right accent too. I found out that's important. But spoke it so they could understand. The Holy Ghost made them to understand doctrine. It, when Peter went to Cornelius' house and as Cornelius and his family believed in the gospel, they were saved and the Holy Ghost fell on them and they began to speak in unknown tongues. They were doing exactly what they did on the day of Pentecost. Peter recognized it because he was there. And he said, these people are Gentiles and they have the Holy Ghost. He knew it. That was the sign that he brought up in James to, or Acts chapter 15. It is not referring to a language that no one knows. Not the speaker. Not any interpreter. Not anybody else living anywhere on the earth where that language would be spoken. He's talking about a completely different language that is spoken nowhere in this earth by mortal men. So if he said, if I come in unto you speaking with, I, I could say it like this, brethren, if I come unto you speaking in Japanese, what shall I profit you? Who in here speaks Japanese? Okay. Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. Even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? In other words, when you play a song, you don't just play the same note over and over again. That's not a song. That's annoying. Okay? So he said, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound... Who shall prepare himself to the battle? Very important. If you're in the military and they still give out the horns, they play taps at the evening, they pray reveille at the morning, and the trumpets were used for different battle calls. Uh, it's funny because in Scotland, it's the pipes. They use the pipes. And so anyway, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. But is anybody there hearing it? Are they understanding it? No. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world. And none of them is without signification. In other words, if you hear a noise, you can 90 time, 99 times out of 100, you can guess at what it is and be right. If you've heard it before. Okay, if somebody starts a car, you go, that's the sound of a car starting, because it's a distinct sound. If someone shoots a gun, you can say, somebody's shooting, it has a distinctive sound. So, like, uh, let's see, verse 11, therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, or if the things of this world didn't have a distinctive sound, how would you know the difference between a gunshot firing and a dinner bell ringing? You're going to run to the one and run from the other. And it's important. So, therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. A, a, a stranger. 
somebody who is unknown to you, somebody from a far country. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. And isn't it interesting that 90% of Charismatics and Pentecostals choose this one gift as their sign that they are from God when in fact Paul took this one and said this is the least of the gifts you should be seeking. To me that's interesting. They pick the one that has the most controversy. Who has controversy with words of wisdom, words of knowledge, uh, you know, interpretation of tongues or prophesying. Nobody has, those don't bother anybody. They pick the one issue out of the gifts of the Spirit that have the biggest problems going along with it. To me, that's not a mistake. All right? So, um, verse 12, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So right there, in that verse, let him that pray in an unknown tongue or let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. God desires interpretation of his word. And he has, he has it as a gift of the Spirit. So the, the Spirit says, I'll help you with this one. I'll get it right. I'll make sure you say the words right. So that the church is edified. Verse 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Again, an unknown tongue in biblical terms defined by the book of Acts chapter 2 was a known human language even though you didn't know the language. Okay? So, verse 14. If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. So you think Paul ever prayed, even if God put it in him to pray in a, somebody else's language? Do you think Paul also asked God to give him interpretation as well? Yeah. That's what he said. He says, if I do it, I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. This, which is why we don't go to opera. Among other reasons. Now, I love classical music. Don't get me wrong. I am not a fan of opera. I'm just not. And most operas are in Italian. And they retain the Italian language throughout because that was the intention. They're very uppity about this point. So you can't understand what the fat lady's singing. You just know that it must be the end. Okay? Yeah, because the fat lady's singing. Okay? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and sing with the understanding also. Else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit... How shall that he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? Everything that we did in Kenya was interpreted, translated. And even today we have pastors that help us out with interpreting what I'm saying. For those who only speak the uh, Samburu or the Turkana language, um, the Anglican pastor, when I go to Sambu to preach, he interprets for me. And you should have heard him when I mentioned about the human cell. And I said, this is a picture of the human cell. And he kept talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. And I'm going, did it take that long? He said, they don't have a word for this. So I had to explain to them not only what the picture is, but what you just said. He said, I had to give a sentence after sentence after sentence to show him this is what he's talking about. Yeah, so anyway, he got it done though. Um, so the blessing is, blessed with the spirits, he that he shall thou, 
He shall, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thy thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. Now look at verse 21. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And that is exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. He used men of other tongues and other lips. He used, this, there's 17 languages, I counted 17 in Acts chapter 2. And there were men standing around that had and knew every one of those languages. It is written in the law, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. And imagine that. We now have the Bible translated in tons of languages in this earth. But people still don't believe it. Even if it's translated in their language, they won't believe it. So he said, verse 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but that's what the Pentecostals and the Charismatics make it. That, oh, he's got the tongues, he's got the Holy Ghost, that's the sign that he has the Holy Ghost. And Paul's saying, it's not a sign to them that believe. It's a sign that to them that believe not. What was he talking about? We know on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the disciples are preaching, and everybody there, primarily, is a Jew. It's a Jewish day, Jewish feast day, and they're required, every male shall go to this, and so all the males, Jews from around, had to go to Jerusalem for this feast day. And so the Holy Ghost pours out the Spirit. These men are speaking in all of these other languages. And it was the Jews who believed not. Believed not what? That it was the Holy Ghost? They believed not Jesus Christ as the Messiah, as the Savior. So that tongues was a sign. It was a sign to the Jews. God was saying, I'm done with you. Did you hear any Hebrew words in there? No. You heard Cappadocian and Phrygian and Pamphylian. And you heard all of these other languages. But you didn't hear any Hebrew. I'm done with you guys. I'm going to go to the people who, even though I didn't know them before, I'm going to find them. And they're going to be my people. And I'm going to be their God. So now, us Gentiles, the people who did not have God as our God, He had not given us His law, we believe Him. We believe Him better than any Jew ever does. We believe Him more and have more understanding of who Christ is. That, so it was a sign to them. That's why He, in fact, if you go to, that, that quotation is from Isaiah 28. Turn there. Let me show you something. Isaiah 28, verse 11. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear. So he said, the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. And he's talking about Israel. First of all, when he said with stammering lips, that was Moses. For his stammering lips, Moses, Old Testament, and other tongues, the disciples, New Testament, Gentiles. Will I speak to this people? So he's including in here the Old and the New Testament. But he said, yet for all of that, they will not listen. And, and I mean this for a purpose. I want them to fall backward and be snared and taken. So now I'm going to work on the Gentiles. I'm going to give them salvation. I'm going to offer them eternal life for 2,000 years. I'll change my mind when I'm done with the Gentiles. Because you can only take so many Jews. And you can only take so many Gentiles. Amen. And you had enough. And God says, I'm going to turn back to them. But I'm going to give them understanding now. So... That's why he said, I believe, that's why he said that it's a sign, not, uh, not for them that believe, uh, but to them that believe not, verse 22. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Prophesying, preaching out of the word. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, 
and all speak with tongues. And there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers. Will they not say, ye are mad. Mad means crazy, out of your mind. These people. So, and you talk to anybody that doesn't go to church, but they've been to a Pentecostal or charismatic church and ask them what their experience was. Yeah, my aunt told me to come. I don't think I ever go back in that place again. I heard better talk in the saloon last Friday night. I got more out of it than I did that. And so Paul's clearly, he is clearly making a case for the fact that what's wrong with what they're doing, even in speaking all these languages that nobody knows, is that nobody knows what they're saying. How can they get blessed by it? And then you bring in lost people. Lost people don't understand it. And then they're going, that's, uh, that's weird. I'm not, going back to the, I'm not going back to that place. But to be honest with you, their churches are a lot fuller than most of the good ones. Now verse 27. Paul lays out clear rules defined rules and to me they're, they're just no ambiguity whatsoever it's very clear if any man speak in an unknown tongue let it be by two or at the most three and that by course which means this is the appetizer this is the meal this is the dessert you don't eat them all at once one two three so i go to that church only charismatic church or pentecostal church I've ever been in that one experience and i heard madness in there not only did i hear the woman behind me duh, 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 but i heard the other ones and i didn't know a word they were saying if they were saying anything now number one can people fake that Sure they can. So I just sort of believed, because it was a good message I heard. If it hadn't been, I probably wouldn't have went down anyway. But it was a good message. And, um, but I didn't get anything out of those people. And what I heard was they were in violation of 1 Corinthians 14, 27. Because they were not doing it by course. Paul said, let all things be done decently and in order. And they refused. Now, the second thing, my second problem with it was verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to do what? To speak. And it was primarily female voices that I heard, not male. Primarily. David, you're shaking your head. You've been there? Okay. So it's primarily women that do it. And do they do it all at once or in turn? Okay. Who's brave enough to try to interpret a woman? No, not one. No, not Yeah, it is. Yeah. So when he said, let your women keep silent in the church, the Holy Ghost said, Mike, do you hear that voice? Yeah. He said, that's not me. It can't be. I would never have this woman speaking in the church service. I would never do that. So I had two witnesses from Scripture telling me, Mike, this is not of God. It can't be of God. God doesn't break his own rules simply because he's God. He never would. He's faithful and just. So, verse 28. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him, notice the masculine here, let him speak to himself and to God. Him. So I knew that what I heard, now again, the, the pastors that I know of, the ones I talked to in Kenya, 
the one I mentioned that visited here, that's what they do. They follow the letter of the law in their men speaking in an unknown tongue by course. First one, then another, then possibly a third. They don't have to have one. But then someone must then stand. There can only be one interpreter. Because how would it be if, if Matthew spoke in tongues, John spoke in tongues, and then Gary got up and said, oh, well, here's what they said. And then all of a sudden, J.R. said, I ain't what they said. Let me, here's, what I, here's what the Holy Ghost has given me. Well, who do we believe? And now there's what? And look at verse 33. God is not the author of that. He's not the author of confusion. Okay? But of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So, any thing that violates scriptures that you want to say is of the Holy Ghost, you better have a really, really good stack of verses for me to show me that it actually was of the Holy Ghost. Because I don't believe it. And I'm not going to be in trouble by God because I'm not believing it. Because I see the rules given very plainly here. Okay? And what you'll hear... This is what Tammy Dotson said, Chris Dotson said all the time. Chris Dotson came out of that church and he asked that pastor. It says plainly right here that they're supposed to do it one after another and you're supposed to have an interpreter. And then it says down here, keep, let your women keep silent. He said, the pastor said, well, that was written for them back in those days. That's not for us now. Where does it say that anywhere? But that was his, that was his in other words, he's not going to admit Oh, we're blatantly violating scriptures. We know it. But God told us to. He's not going to say that. He's going to come up with some lame excuse why they can break God's word and violate scriptures. By coming, make, inventing a new doctrine that says this was only for the time period of 33 AD to 112 AD at 7 o'clock in the afternoon. But it's not anywhere in scriptures. Acts chapter 2 um, let's start in verse eight. And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. Do we hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God? So, to me, the Bible is defining for you. First of all, I don't see anybody in the Old Testament speaking in an unknown tongue. I just, I don't see that anywhere. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, if I run through the index of what I know from the Old Testament, I don't, it doesn't come to mind of anybody doing this in the Old Testament. So we have an, a New Testament thing, and that's one of the reasons why God changed the language of the law from Hebrew to Greek. Because he's changing the intention of the law and he's changing the law in general. And he's coming up with a new covenant. So it's in a new language, preached by new people. Um, it's a new covenant, not based upon the old covenant and so on. So I think this tongues goes along with it. And it also directs you to the people whom God was going to save during this time. These are primarily Gentile places. Places where Gentiles would live and their language were Gentiles language. And um, oh, what's her name? The New Age Bible versions. Gail Ripplinger wrote a book and she did some research and I'm trying to remember. She said one of the early translations of the Bible was the Gothic translation. It was around 150 A.D. by a man by the name of Ulfilis. And his people were the Goths. So he wanted the Bible translated into their tongue. And I'm trying to remember who she said they were. She said they were in this list. But I can't remember who it says, she, who, who it says they were. But she had done some research and found that the Gothic people actually came from one of these groups that had heard the Holy Ghost speak in their language. So... Some 120 some odd years later then, God lays it on the heart of a man to start translating the Bible into the Gothic language. And when you read the Gothic language, you can tell that some of our words originated in the Gothic language. 
So Gothic language is like a great, 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 great grandfather to the English that we speak now. It was headed our direction, I'll say. Amen? Uh, Revelation 7 and then, uh, well, I don't know. Revelation 7, 9, after this, and I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, people, and tongues. God wanted the Gentiles to understand the words, to understand the language, to speak to us without someone trying to interpret who's not giving us a false interpretation, an interpretation that we can trust. Which, is a, which do you think is happening? Do you think, here's what Paul said, for we are not as many which, and he either said, corrupt the word of God or peddle the word of God for profit. Which do you think he said? Corrupt, that's when our King James. The new trans, including the new King James says, peddle the word of God for profit. Okay, but I don't believe that's what he said. They changed the entire meaning of Psalm 12, verse 7, Psalm 12, 6 says the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. Verse 7 says, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever, meaning the words. The NIV took that whole verse and removed it away from God speaking about the words of the Lord to people. Thou shalt preserve us. You, God, will preserve us and keep us. They changed the entire meaning of that verse. It went from talking about the Bible to talking about us. And that's, that is a terrible translation. So if you had a person with a King James in a church, and you had a person with an NIV, a New American Standard, a Christian Standard, because they all match that rendering of Psalm 12, 7, you would have confusion in your church. What does it say? Well, I believe you take all the translations together, and you look at them and say, this is, I, I can probably see what God is saying in all this, but they're contradictory. Judah shall rule with God, yet Judah is unruly against God. Which one? Is he the son of God or a son of the gods or one of the gods? They contradict one another. You can't, and you can't have that. That's, that's worse than them coming and speaking in unknown tongues. So God clearly, Revelation 7, he's clearly wanting the Gentiles to have knowledge of the word of God. Not some ecstatic experience with the word of God, or words that they, think of, that they think is from God, but they don't know what those words are. Um, yeah, I'm going to do this next Sunday. Um, we're going to get into evidences in the Bible that if it's an unknown tongue, God's going to translate it. So what was, Gary, what was written on the wall in Belshazzar's day Remember the handwriting on the wall? What was written there? Remember? For a good time call. No. It was mine, mine, tikel, you farsen. And of course, Belshazzar was drunk. He didn't have a clue what it said. And it troubled him. I, he immediately sobered up. And somebody said, go get Daniel. Daniel did this for Nebuchadnezzar all the time. If anybody would know this, and I suspect, King, it's from God. And if it's from God, if anybody knows it, Daniel would. And if it's from God, King, I think you're probably fixing to be in trouble. But it was an unknown phrase. And Daniel showed up to make it known. Okay? And then I'll, I'm going to give you a, here's, a, here's your homework for the week. Can you find a place in the Bible where angels are speaking a language that no one understands? Okay? Because their thing is, though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity. Aha! Angels speak with tongues. So, can you show me a place in the Bible 
where angels speak and no one knows what it says. Okay? Look for it. Look for it. Okay? All right, let's stand to our feet. And again, to my brethren who would disagree with me on some of this, number one, I appreciate your love for the Bible and the words of the Bible and that you follow the Scripture. And the only disagreement I have with you is what this language is. And um, I, I just can't bring myself to just coming down on guys that I know believe the Bible. No matter how much I disagree with them, I just, I can't do it. So, because I think brothers ought to be brothers, amen? Brothers usually fist fought it out. So, Father in heaven, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for making us brethren, family, part of your, part of your family. Thank you for being our God, and thank you, God, for interpreting your word for us, not leaving us out in the dark. God, I, I cannot, I don't even want to think of where I would be, what my life would be like, had you not translated your word for us so we could understand it. And Lord, I look to be one of those many peoples, nations, and tongues around your throne. That's what I want. And I know that's what these people want as well. So Father, every time we read the Bible, give us a little bit more understanding. Give us knowledge. Help us, Father, to unlock mysteries things that have been kept secret, which are now made manifest. And Father, just give us a desire, a thirst, a hunger for knowledge and understanding of your word. I, I know some things, but God, there's some things I want to know. I want to know more. I want to have more understanding. Questions that have been unanswered with me for years. God, help me to not rest until I seek you out in those answers. Bless your word, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you.